Hi everyone. Uh, we are here at the Georgia Budget and Policy Institute. My name is Stacy Fox, and I'm our CEO. And I'm Ray Calfati. I'm our senior analyst, and kind of I work with Justice and Criminal Legal System work. And we're coming to you right after Governor Brian Kemp's uh, annual State of the State speech, and wanted to just share some top line thoughts on what we heard, what we didn't hear, what we wanted to hear. <laughs> so thanks, Ray, for doing this with me. I appreciate it. I think for us, maybe the big thing that we want to start with and what we wanted to hear more about is uh, what the governor likes to call the surplus. Uh, and I think at GBPI, we would call this unspent public funds. But year over year, you know, our governor has the power to estimate the revenue and has greatly underestimated that revenue to the point where we're three years in a row, likely another year this year, going to end up with more than $5 billion in state unspent public dollars um, and to the tune of now 11 billion dollars in undesignated funds plus another 5 billion in the rsr fund right. a revenue shortfall return. yes yes uh so not a lot about that today i think we've heard a little bit about that in some other speeches the governor has made recently but that's a lot of money and i think you know we would like one, obviously, for the General Assembly to be leaning more into the actual budget process because we should, we believe at GBPI that the state actually hasn't met all its fiscal obligations to the state. And we are severely underfunding services and education and health care, our state agencies, and that we could be using these dollars. And that our spending hasn't even kept up with sort of per capita spending in the state when you think about population growth and inflation. You know, you look at from like 2019 to 2024, average inflation is for over 4%. Yeah, yeah. 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 And then population growth has been over 400,000 in that same time. So we haven't kept up our spending with what's actually happening in reality in the state. So what 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 did you want to hear, Ray, about the surplus in particular? Well, I mean, you know, certainly, you know, we want to hear about how we can you know, keep ourselves from having a growing, growing surplus. You right. know, like when we, you know that revenue shortfall uh, reserve fund that we have, we had record levels of that. You know, you know, before we got into the pandemic, um, when we were already hitting record levels, and we like almost doubled that or, or right. more. You know, and you know, while it's good to have you know money in the bank saved for you know rainy day and you know, when there are emergencies, at the same time, when you have so much um, that's that's in reserve, we're not meeting the the, the needs of Georgia's across the state, you know, that leads to, um, you know, a, a lot of folks who could be in more prosperous positions, you know, not being that way. You know, and so many agencies, um, you know, not being funded the way that, well, not, not spending money the way they should. And, you know, when we have, you know, 15 to 22 percent, you know, every year for the last couple of years of the money we've allocated, you know, across state agencies not being used and going back into, um, you know, these undesignated reserves, right. you know, that's a lot of, you know, people power that we're not having across the state. You know, that's that's right. a lot of them in these. And I think just to make sure that everybody knows, the revenue shortfall reserve was instituted in the 70s to create a rainy day fund for the state should something really terrible happen. And it is constitutionally mandated at 15% of the surplus that happens in any given budget year. And it's full based on that mandate. And the $11 billion that we're talking about are undesignated. That's on top of the rainy day fund, and we're not even talking about or giving to the lottery reserve and some of the other reserve funds that exist in the state. So I think uh, there's a lot of pressure, um, a lot more talk about how we are spending our dollars raising and spending our dollars to support Georgia. So I think we wanted to hear a little bit more about that today and a little bit disappointed. But nonetheless, our brilliant team at GB has come up with some ideas about what we could do with those undesignated dollars, right, Ray? Absolutely. I mean, there's things we can do on our, our public school front, which could be bearing the biggest brunt of this underfunding. You know, when we think about the way that the state puts so much pressure and burden on local governments right. to fund public schools, you know, we Increasingly could, so. Right, yeah. right. And when we think about school transportation, when you think about um, employee health care programs, when you, you think about the way that we could be um, ensuring that the, the children who experience poverty have you know special funds designated for them so that they can have a leg up. Right. Um, you know that's you know these are the type of you know negative effects of you know underfunding you know various forms of government. But as, as I mentioned, public education certainly could be one 
um, that feels in most. So and when we think about the ways that we can be better um, when it comes to you know utilizing this surplus, you know, we've come we've had you know our brilliant team, and we think about uh Ethe Finch Floyd, who's talked a lot about um, you know, establishing a child a child um, a child care trust fund yes. you know, for the state. You know, that that's really certain, innovative and yeah. new. Yeah, yeah and, then, the, and we can pair with existing, you know, funding sources. That eventually starts to feed itself financially. Yes, yeah. yes, you know, you know, that's certainly you know one one way that we can use you know these funds to be able to create a, a foundation and a boost that we can have you know that can be, that can certainly last. You know, certainly along with like school transportation, you know, modernizing our school bus fleet. Yeah. You know, and, and Dr. Stephen Owens at GDPI, he's mentioned so much about this in his research about what we can do. You know, to, to make sure that we have you know a fleet of buses that can that can serve the needs to get to get kids to school. Right. Um. You know, along because with, so many are over fifteen years old yes. and not really safe to be on the roads, and we don't have enough of them. Right. You know, and, kids are standing in aisles and spending hours on buses they don't need to. And we have we have workers, you know, drivers of these buses yeah. who are underpaid. You know, who've been right. underpaid for quite some time. And that's another thing that certainly drives. And um, districts that have now been increasingly burdened to pay for their benefits, which yes. happened in last year's fiscal year. Yes, yes. Yeah. And, and, and just, you know, to that point, just as far as just, and, you know, we certainly can use this, and, and the governor has alluded to this, and we'll talk about it a little bit more, um, about, you know, using these undesignated reserves to be able to better pay, you know, state workers across, you know, a whole of different entities, particularly the frontline, you know, staff who do so many critical, who provide so many critical needs for the Georgians across the state, you know, depend on. Yeah. I think, I, I'm so glad that we we're able to raise some of those unique ideas and also some of those ideas that we've been talking about for ages. The big thing for me about these unspent public funds that the governor calls the surplus is that we hear so often in the dome that folks don't want us to commit to recurring spending out of those dollars. And that feels a little frustrating at this point that we're, what, four years into this surplus happening year over year at the tune of $5 billion a year that these really are recurring funds. These, is, these are not funds that we have to look at to just spend for one-time expenses. We actually can do some bigger, bolder investments with these funds. Yes, yes, but this is a misuse of recurring funds that should be going to our state you know, to serve our people. Yeah. Well, I have to admit, you know, sitting here in the conference room with our team, I don't think that we heard a lot of new things today out of the state of the state, but we did hear some things that we thought were good. I mean, I think we heard some investments into DFAC staff, child protection staff, um, and teachers. Uh, I think the teacher raises about $400 million, um, we think, uh, but also those uh, cost of living increases for DFAC staff. Yes, and I want to make, you know, make another point that, um, you know, when we think about, you know, child welfare workers mm -hmm. compared to, like, eligibility workers, you know, for SNAP and other, and other you know, yeah. um, forms of health care access, they're not paired the same. Right, we're going into this, you know, these, these on a pay level, right? Yeah. Right, going into these, you know, cost of living adjustments. So, I it, it could have been um, something I was, I was, I guess, hoping, expecting, wondering whether the governor would have spoken a little bit further on that as far as like what could be done to make sure there's parity across, you know, two different types of frontline workers who are both, you know, very, very integral to what we need to serve our children across the state. So, you know, that's something I, I, I certainly, you know. Could have seen more we didn't at this time but hopefully there'll, there'll, be, there'll be more said about that um, i think that's so important and i like that approach you know we, we'd like to see more of a balanced approach here too because you're the eligibility workers you're talking about right now in the state are so overburdened with medicaid return redetermination which is happening all over the country snap redeterminations and enrollments and then enrollments and pathways i mean they're just so backlogged already uh, and to not be thinking about them in the same way is unbalanced Absolutely. yeah Absolutely. i think that's a good point also thought it was really good that we heard some uh, continued investment in our mental health infrastructure not a lot of details there so i'm looking forward to us digging into the budget some more to see what that looks like but i certainly think this is a great step forward to continue the legacy and work of former our late speaker waltzman's work yeah yeah i mean one thing I know that wasn't said at all, you know, was a mention about um, our Pathways program, you know, which the governor has fought so hard for um, to get, you know, in, in, in a program which has only increased, you know, enrollment in Medicaid by about 1%. 
Um, so, you know, that's something that I was surprised to not hear anything about, you know, being that, you know, this is something that's, you know, been his baby for quite a bit. Yeah, that was a feather in his cap last year. Right, and, you know, the, 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 the big elephant in the room also just about, you know, how that could compare to, you know, a full Medicaid expansion. Yeah, um, we didn't hear the governor talk about that at all. Right. Which could be a good thing. I mean, I think in an ideal world, we wanted the governor to uh, mention it and support it, but not mentioning it at all is not a bad thing. I mean, that could be good for, you know, considering all the buzz that's happening under the dome. Yeah, there's, there's certainly quite a bit as to, you know, whether, you know, the lieutenant governor, you know, has... He said the word expansion. Right. <laughs> uh, I know we were talking here in the conference room, what do we do when that happens? Is there going to be a parade? <laughs> um, well, so the budget did drop while the speech was going on, and I know lots more to come around that, and we'll talk about that at the end here today, but I think we saw something really good in the budget uh, yes. at first glance, at least I think Dr. Owens did. Yes, yes, when it comes to school transportation funding, so there will be an additional $200 million, I believe, to support that um, and to increase the state's share of that by uh, up to 40%, you know, yeah. when it previously has been only 20%. State has been covered on that, so that is a huge win. Huge. Um, when you think about you know public schools, when you think about the, the type of burdens that, that can be taken away from local governments to be able to fund their public schools. Yeah. Um, now the state you know could be stepping in you know quite a bit more. Yeah, because we've been decreasing the amount of money we've been investing in transportation year over year to the point of I mean down to about twenty percent that the state is covering. So for the state to notice that as a problem is huge and. I think in, when we were talking about the spending of surplus dollars, the lower end of modern, modernizing the entire fleet was about $850 million. So $200 million towards that is a huge step in the right direction. So really applaud the governor for doing that. I think the other thing that um, I want to just go back to the cost of living increases uh, for teachers and agency staff. I think as a budget organization, I just want to raise this issue that I think we're in a little bit of a dangerous territory here about the actions and power of the governor. I mean, I think that we believe that the governor seems to be using his state of emergency authority to announce and obligate funds before the legislature has voted on them. Right. And while the investment in the funds is a good thing, this is, as a budget organization, I think we're, we want to lift up that this is a process point. And that obviously the state needs to follow the state's rules. And that means that the legislature needs to vote before those funds go out the door. Unfortunately, that's not what's been happening. So I think that was a really good point that we need to raise uh, that seems to have been kind of become a theme here. Yeah, you know, we certainly don't want to have a precedent being set, you know, where governors be able, in, in a sense, you know, make moves before, you know, the legislature is, you know, constitutionally you know, mandated to do so. So, yeah. uh, you know, we, we, you know, when a governor says, like, hey, you know, we're going to, you know, do this particular thing with our budget before a legislator, are you able to, you know, to convene and make their decisions collectively on that, you know, that's so easy to Yeah, I mean, why do we need a general assembly to pass a budget if the governor can just do that? So anyways, well, I think that's a little problematic. So we heard some things we didn't love today, right? I think the big one for us is the vouchers. You know, I mean, I think we at GBPI, I know we at GBPI, are very clear that we are not in support of pulling money away from our public, public education funds. And SB 233 last year proposed doing that uh, at about $6,000. Um, and I think the governor really leaned into that in his state of the state today. Uh, and I know that there's been a lot of talk about uh, you know the vote that went down in the House in the last days of session last year, and or, or whether those, those Republicans did right, not support that. right, and are those Republican votes going to hold or not? But I didn't love the governor leaning into that today, especially when we're in a place where we haven't fully and fairly and equitably funded public schools in Georgia. I think you brought up uh, the opportunity weight issue. So, any thoughts about? Uh, about hearing the governor lean into this voucher issue or yes. school choice. I, I mean, you know, he kind of uh, brought it down to focusing on the kids. But yeah, we would love to focus on the kids too without pulling money away from them. Right, without pulling almost like $190 million away That's from right. the That's how much. You know, that's SB 233, what we thought that cost was, yeah. Yes, yes. So, you know, to, for him to try to put his weight again on, you know, a, a voucher bill or, you know, or, or a voucher push that's going to pull so much money. Know, out of public schools is certainly not the way we would have we would have wanted to see um, 
that's some, that's something we would not have wanted him to mention or, or support, you know, knowing you know, what it can do to the public schools, but even more particularly what it can do to uh, rural, rural. Public, excuse, yeah. public schools. That's you know, the key. And anybody who lives in any part of rural Georgia, you know, and how much those schools mean to their to their community, to their economy, to their society. You know, the jobs, yes, absolutely. The jobs, the Friday night football games, yes. you know, all of that, you know, they don't want to see that go. And this is something that could lead to that, you know, if we have a, a we have this type of voucher bill. Yeah, absolutely. So it looks like we'll be back in that fight this session. Um, there's a, I know we'll probably drop it in the chat, but there's a great map that we generated at the end of last session to really highlight this rural issue. Because the point is, is that research shows that these voucher dollars really only go to families that are already sending their kids to private schools. And the majority of our rural districts in Georgia don't have private schools. So they're not going to benefit from a bill like this, which is why those, I think those votes um, landed the way they did last session. Uh, we also heard the governor mention fast forwarding the um, fast forwarding the state in, the state income tax from mm -hmm. the flat tax bill in 2022. Right. I guess more specifically, you know, fast fast forwarding like the state income debt the, 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 the reduction. reduction of the state mm -hmm. income tax rate. You know, that's certainly something you know um, you know we don't want to see as far as how much money could be lost. I believe the governor mentioned about you know this is about three billion, three billion dollars over ten years. I right. Think Right, yeah. that can go back to the people. But you know, when you think about that as far as you know, that's three billion dollars that don't serve, you know, that certainly don't serve the people, you know, not as you know, so that's not something we want to see. But also when we think about taking revenue, you know, more revenue out of the state when we're not when we're already, you know, underfunding so many agencies, you know, that's also gonna create a reliance on some other type of revenue, you know, and, and and with Which you know that, very well. Right, you know, and, and with the way that the governor has mentioned, you know, having a, a further a further expansion, you know, of, um, you know, policing and surveillance, um, you know, this could also lead to, you know, higher, higher um, you know, reliance on criminal court fines and fees, which are a tax in themselves, you know. So, and a lot of our counties have abusive reliance on those, absolutely, right? Absolutely. I mean, you know, and even in, like in, in 2021, you know, Georgia had, you know, at least 26 localities that relied, that had abusive levels of reliance on fines and fees to fund their local government. So, and, and, this, and even with what they rely on, there's still money that gets funneled to the state. So the state is relying on, you know, that type of, of abusive, you know, fines and fee practice as well. So, you know, when we think about lowering, you know, a, a, a lowering revenue, revenue from, yeah. you know, from, a, from a state income tax, we still have to get that money from somewhere. That's right. And we don't want to quietly or in the dark try to get that money through our criminal legal system. So. You know, that, that's certainly something to, to, to pay attention to. Yeah. Um, certainly something that, you know, as UBI, we certainly do not want to see, you know, loss of revenue in one way and another form of regressive revenue, you know, rising in, in another. So, On um, Georgians that are already struggling. Absolutely. absolutely. Right. I mean, when we talk about the inflation costs that are happening, I mean, those are happening on life's necessities, right? And so those who are already struggling are struggling only more. Right. When those costs are going up and these... Uh, Sort of abusive types of aggressive taxes show up, right? Right, and, you know, and when the governor mentions, hey, you know, people need to have more money to pay for their groceries and for their everyday cost of living, you know, these type of you know, you know, higher level of reliance that can be had, um, you know, through you know, creating a situation where we can need more, where we could rely on more, you know, fines and fees in the state to be able to fund our governments could take away money that people people could be using, you know, with all these basic necessities. That and when most of that type of, um, you know, when, when fines and fees, you know, typically, you know, they, they typically hit those who are, who are at or below the economic margins, who the governor claims, who the governor says, like, hey, you know, these are the people we want to support, these are the people we want to have, you know, more money in their pocket, more, more, more money going into their pockets. Yeah. You know, we have to make sure that we're not, you know, creating other situations That's that right. can take more money out of their pockets. That's right. I do want to highlight something I thought. Um, good today too. You know, today is National Human Trafficking Awareness Day, and especially here in Atlanta, when we have such a high human trafficking problem. I really love the, you know, the governor highlighting the first lady's work around human trafficking, and um, I know they just cut the ribbon on Grace's place this week or last week. So um, I thought that was really important. It's a really important issue in the state, and so I was glad to hear that highlighted. There was a couple of things that we didn't hear on the State of the Union, I'm sorry, State of the State today, uh, but we have heard in a couple of other speeches about the governor that I think that we want to just clarify, specifically some things that got mentioned in 
uh, exit, the issues, exit right? issues yesterday morning uh, at Mercedes-Benz. One of them was uh, these new investments in some of our higher ed programs, specifically a new medical school at my alma mater, Go Dogs, mm -hmm. and a new dental school at uh, Georgia Southern. Um, and the governor talks about taking the funds for these programs out of the surplus. And I think, again, we just want to remind everybody that we believe that year over year, these recurring increase in unspent public funds should cover those costs without having to pull those out of the surplus. So I think, uh, you know, it is all about language and framing. And I think that the governor is trying to indicate that maybe the governor wants to, you know, use some of those surplus funds for these programs. We don't need those surplus funds because we're going to end up in another surplus this year so that the money he's allocated in the amended budget and the next year's budget can come out of the general coffers. Right. Um, I think there was another thing that came up at Exit Issues, Ray, that you wanted to mention. Yes, yes. You know, the governor mentioned about um, uh, the, the, I guess, you know, wanting to stop an expansion of union, like union growth across the state. Um, you know, and, and certainly looking to put support around a bill that will make it harder for employers who want to have, I guess you could say, to, to make it, describe it simply, to have a streamlined effort you know, for workers to be able to decide whether they want to have a union or not at their employer. Um, and, and the governor wants to, to be able to stop that, to make that much harder for employers to do that. You know, right now, um, things, you know, he, he mentioned a thing called secret ballots. And secret ballots is something that, you know, this is something that, you know, you know the federal government, the National Labor Relations Board, Labor Relations Board, you know, already, you know, this is already in place. But there's something else that, that takes place, you know, where, um, you know, workers can, you know, don't have to have this, um, that you know, don't have to use that mechanism to be able to decide whether they want a union or not, and so you know. So ultimately, the governor wants to limit you know ways that people can get unions, you know, that, that people can get unions across the state, and that's not something we certainly you know, so, um, we, we would we not we would not want the governor to, to lean that way. You know, particularly in a state that you know still has a minimum wage that's at five fifteen. Right. You know, we know the lowest that, in the country. Right. We know you know research. There's, there's, there's plenty of research that shows. You know that, that union support and union organizing has led to so many um, great worker justice wins. And you know, when you think about you know employers, you know particularly in Georgia, um, with a minimum wage of five fifteen, you know workers don't get paid with their work; they get paid what they can negotiate and organize for. Right. So you know when when you have you know um, you know rhetoric that says hey you know we want to make it harder for unions to be able to grow in our state, and we've seen you know direct and um, you know indirect or um, uh, spillover positive effects from the work that unions have done, particularly with the United Auto Work Workers Union. Oh, yeah. You know, right. and, and what they've done for, you know, workers in auto manufacturing. You know, we certainly want to see, you know, that grow in Georgia because we know that, you know, unions are a powerful, beneficial thing for workers. Yeah. Um, and um, Georgia should be a place where it's great to do business, but it's also great to be able to work, raise a family, and to have a, a, a real, you know, career trajectory that, um, you know, provide a little way to forward. And wealth building for families. And I was just looking at my notes, Ray, because I wrote down a quote from the governor today who said, we trust the citizens more than the government. I think um, when we go back to unions, then we need to trust the citizens and their voice and their power um, to make decisions that are best for them in the workplace. So that feels a little incongruent to mm -hmm. me. But I'm so glad you brought that up. There were a number of things that came up to me in the governor's speech that I was sitting with and one of them is you know that we are working to be the best state uh, to live work and raise a family in and you brought up minimum wage how can we be a best state to live work and raise a family in when we're not even fairly paying people across the state of Georgia and we're us and Wisconsin are the two states in the in the 50 that have the lowest minimum wage in the country this is an easy lift to invest more in Georgia and, and to make sure that you know our wages should grow, you know, as our economy With grows. With inflation, right? You know, that's that way, true. people can you know be able to stay above the curve. You know, when, when prices go up, you know, their their pay goes up. You know, in, in rates that are above that, so they can't afford to live. They can't afford to grow. They can afford to prosper. Any other policy priorities of ours that come to mind, Ray, when you think about that? Live, work, raise a family. Oh, um, I, mean, I, I certainly think that. Um, when we think about you know other things like you know cash bail expansion, um, I know that that's something that you know has been mentioned. 
um, that we certainly you know, do not support because that's another way of um, you know, criminalizing those who are at or below the economic margins. And, and we certainly want to see you know, a, a reversal of stances on that yeah. um, because you know, Georgia you know, is just increasing, you, know, you see it increasing you know, inequality across the state among those who have and, and those who don't have. Um, and for those who don't have, you know, it's so much easier, um, unfortunately, for them to get, um, you know, for them to fall into rabbit holes within the, the criminal legal system that oftentimes criminal, criminalize you just simply because you cannot afford right. to pay um, for justice and due process, you know, not, not because, you know, you don't deserve it. Right. You know, what comes to mind to me, uh, just given my career trajectory, is family issues, right? If we say that we're a state that we want to support raising a family in, we have a maternal mortality crisis in the state. People who are wanting to be pregnant and grow their families, specifically black women, are dying and don't have to be. The CDC says four out of five pregnancy-related deaths are preventable. We've even had an increase in black infant deaths in Georgia. So that feels like a big issue. Paid family leave feels like an issue that we need to be leaning into if we're actually wanting to be that state where, we, where people can raise a family. And I'll mention what a, one other thing, you know, that certainly is part of, the, part of our policy for it. As far as you know, just modernizing our unemployment insurance system, yeah. you know, we think about, um, you know, when people lose a job and no fault of their own, you know, they need to be able to adequately and equitably access, you know, wage protections to be able to help them to feed their families along the way, um, you know, to, to stay out of deep poverty so that they can have a career trajectory and, and a ladder that can help them to be more prosperous. So, you know, um, you know, when we have a you know, we're in the process of, of beginning that now, um, so that's certainly something we want to have. Um, uh, that's focus on the needs of workers and not just simply on the needs um, of, of big business. Well, thank you, Ray, for being willing to try this out with me and jump online. We hope you heard some things that were helpful and informative today. Lots more to come. You can count on the Georgia Budget and Policy Institute to be the organization and the experts like Ray that are watching how the state raises and spends its dollars, both in the amended year budget, FY24, and the proposed FY25 budget. We're going to be digging into that over the next week. Um, and if you want to hear more about that, you can join us next Thursday morning at the Loudermilk Conference Center at 8 a.m., where you'll hear our uh, analysts, our brilliant team, dig into the state's budget, talking about where um, we are supporting Georgia in some, some places that we aren't. If you want to join us at next week's conference, we'll drop the link in the chat. You can also go to our website at gbpi.org slash insights2024 to, to uh, sign up, register, and join us. Insights24. Thanks, Lauren. Um, and count on us to continue to provide you the information and the backstory um, as we work at GBPI to create a Georgia where all Georgians are prospering. Um, and living and working and raising a family the way they want to. So thanks, y'all. We'll see you next time.